What's the craziest shit DARPA has done? Like the oh my absolutely God. most mind bending <clears throat> thing that they've created. I think the bio hybrids, because when I and when I say that thing they have done, right? So let's for anyone who isn't familiar with DARPA, right? It's the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. A mouthful. They added the D. Um, they added later, the right? D mm -hmm. for defense, but it is the most powerful, most secretive most productive military agency in the world. And I kind of believe that before I wrote the book, most people had not heard of DARPA. I mean, I think, you know, or at least when I was doing press for it, it was like shocking. I think you're right about that. So that's fascinating. And part of that has to do with DARPA likes the public perception of, you know, that they like do all these things for the good of humanity. And Actually, we know from the declassified documents again, or actually this was not, not declassified. This was the statement by the first SecDef at the time, um, the, the SecDef at the time that the DARPA was created, um, Neil McElroy, an advertising executive who became a secretary of defense. Um, <laughs> he said he went to Congress to get the funding and he said this agency is going to create the vast weapon systems of the future. That is what DARPA does. They are always 20 years ahead of anything that you or I know. So any technology that is like, what the hell was that that I just saw and you're not supposed to have seen, that's DARPA. Right? They were doing Neuralink in the 90s, right? They were doing – they are always doing things 20 years before yeah. you know about them because mm -hmm. they do what is called blue sky technology. Blue sky right? research and technology, yes. yes. And they have to be ahead of the curve. They have That's to be, amazing. right? Is that is DARPA the only – I mean when it comes to this kind of stuff like innovating – weapons for defense and national security. That's probably the only thing, the only apparatus that exists that's doing unlimited blue sky sort of research and development, right? Because I mean, they that have unlimited we, money. That we know of, but like, I mean, nothing surprises me anymore. And so when you find out there's like some agency you've never heard of, it's like, oh, of course, right? Like look at NRO, the National Reconnaissance Organization, right? National Reconnaissance Office, okay? NRO was created in 1961. No one knew it existed until 1993 when it was declassified. So they were the, involved in the first technology, the first satellite technology. So when I interviewed uh, Dr. Bud Whelan, who was the first, science, the first director of science and technology at CIA, he, was, he identified himself as the mayor of Area 51 because he worked out there. And he built the first satellite called Corona. This is like back in the old days when it literally took wet film images, dropped the wet film, and the Lockheed pilots would retrieve the film as it floated – the canister of film floated down from space with a parachute attached to it. I'm not kidding, right? So this is NRO. They're in charge of everything above, right? Right. And it was so classified, no one knew it existed for more than 30 years. Is it true that NRO officers or people in the NRO have to be cleared through CIA, NASA, and something else? That I don't know. Okay. But I do know they have their own classifications. Air Force, that's what things. it was. Yeah, I mean, they have they, they all kind of work with one another, for one another, okay. you know. Um, I mean, one of the guys I interview in Nuclear War, Richard Garwin, who designed the thermonuclear bomb, drew the plans for Edward Teller, right? When Edward Teller couldn't figure out how to actually make the bomb explode, mm -hmm. Richard Garwin drew the design that allowed it to, right? He's 93. He's been – he's a major source for me in Nuclear War in my book, right? He was one of the founders of NRO. So they all work part and parcel. Mm -hmm. But the point of this when you say – you know, is DARPA doing the most advanced technology? Maybe. But maybe there's another organization like NRO. I mean, right. people forget there are 17, at least 17 intelligence agencies. It's not just CIA. 17? So, 17. I mean, Google them, look them up, right? That's why there's now a director of national intelligence. So right, there right, are, right, right. you know, there are – and I think that to stay ahead of the enemy – you know, air quotes or not air quotes, to stay ahead, the federal government is always playing not just chess, but like, you know, move the magic balls, right? And what's under what hat. And so things need to be hidden so that secrets can be kept. 
when the F-117 was retired, I went to the um, ceremony with Ed Lovick, the grandfather of stealth technology, right? And it was amazing. It was up there at Lockheed at Skunk Works, okay? <laughs> and they made this announcement that was, that was, I just remember this one line, and I am paraphrasing, but they said, like, we created the F-117. It was like a 20-year project, you know, DARPA. Um, and for 20 years, I think there were 10,000 people cleared on the program. This is what the guy was saying that was giving this speech. And he said, and no one leaked it. And then he said, oh, correction. It was actually 10,000 people cleared plus Tom Clancy. What? <laughs> oh <laughs> revealing God. revealing that, you know, Tom Clancy had the in with the Lockheed guys. And that's where he got a lot of his, his secrets. Interesting. Yeah. One of the most interesting things I thought about the DARPA book also was that they were inviting – science fiction writers mm. to meet with them. Like, I think one of them was the writer for Terminator. No, no, no. That was me going to the Pentagon. Oh, that was A reporting was trip, right? Oh, okay. But they did, but yes, yes, to your point, they did mm. after 9-11, the government, you know, remember that statement, you're too young, but after 9-11, there was a statement that was kind of an echo throughout, you know, it was in the zeitgeist that 9-11 was a failure of imagination, Right that no one could foresee that terrorists could hijack airplanes and fly them into buildings, except for Tom Clancy. Um, and so that led DARPA to create, to hire science fiction writers. This is like an anecdotal project for DARPA. I mean, it's like a nothing burger. But it was really interesting to me mm -hmm. because they hired science fiction writers, a couple of whom I interviewed, to kind of sit around a round table and come up with the craziest ideas they could, you know, of terrorist attacks and of surprise wow. attacks to then try to game out how they could defend against them, which is not a bad idea. On that, repo on that reporting trip when I went to the Pentagon, I brought with me Chris Carter, as I was saying. We were working on Area 51 as a television show at the time, and also Gail Ann Hurd, who co-wrote The Terminator with her then-husband, James Cameron, but who was also the producer on The Walking Dead, right? And when we went into the Pentagon, it was wild because – and again, this goes back to that idea that people are just humans with, you know – I mean, of course they're humans, but what I mean is we're all just like people with like, you know, spouses at home and animals and pets and kids and things because bringing those two to the Pentagon was like bringing Brad Pitt to a Girl Scout party, right? I mean, you know, it was no longer Annie put your pen away, which it usually is. Like no one lets me take notes at the Pentagon because then they can't go be on the record, right? It's just background. Oh, right. And it was – and, you know, we had our cell phones out. We were taking, cam you know, pictures. The generals were like, come in here. Hide the classified stuff. I write about this in the book because it was so astonishing. They – and Chris Carter had created the character of the smoking man for the X-Files, mm. which is the quintessential – boogeyman, you know, the government boogeyman, right, who's always smoking and is up to no good, right? The He's sort of like the embodiment of conspiracy. And the generals loved that. And then Gail, having co-written The Terminator with Skynet, the generals loved that. And I found that both comforting and terrifying. And so did Chris and Gail. Right. Um, but, but the interesting part about, you know, we're all just sort of people at the end of the day was like at a couple points during this, this traveling around, you know, going through the Pentagon, and even though when you went into the bathroom, your minder had to follow you in there, right? That's how it works there mm. in the E-ring, mm. um, which is where the Joint Chiefs are. But at one point, someone was like, wait a minute. Chris Carter, just a second. And he's like, ding, you know, dials his wife. Honey, you're not going to believe this. Chris Carter's here. You can ask that question about episode eight, season 12, you know, and literally put him on the phone with the wife to answer the question. And it was like really interesting that everybody at the end of the day has real people problems and real people curiosity and real people questions most of them right maybe that's a good thing maybe that's what keeps us all from you know launching nuclear war not yeah. us launching nuclear war but them launching nuclear war.